flame trench components assembled at Massey's, even more mystery items at Sanchez, a fully closed door for Mega Bay 1, and plumbing on the new GSC tanks continues at the launch site. Hey everyone and welcome back, my name is Jeff A and we'll talk about that and more in episode 32 of Starbase Flyover Update, brought to you by RGV Aerial Photography. Now that the weather has finally broken, let's take a look around and spot the many changes since the last flyover. Ok, let's begin here at Massey's structural test site. Special shout out to Brocky for creating these labelled maps for all four sites at Starbase. Here's what it looked like in our previous flyover on February 8th. This week we will get some answers to a few mysteries from the past few flyovers. Starting at the top right of the site we can see that the work is progressing well on the static fire stand for Starship with formwork and embeds for the ship placement side of the flame trench. Further back, the drilling rig has been reconfigured to the constant flight auger with cages for piles being assembled on the concrete slab above. Two finished piles can be seen next to the rig. Shifting to the newly spotted foundations, we can see that the conduit has been laid in trenches going towards the back of the site for future infrastructure, possibly a fluids bunker. To the left, we see work is progressing on the methane part of the tank farm with two new tanks installed. Their use is currently unknown. Moving down slightly, we can see work is progressing to plumb in the methane tanks with more piping visible. Looking at the LOX hippos, the new plumbing for liquid oxygen and nitrogen, as well as high pressure gaseous nitrogen, has been spliced into the existing pipes, leaving the nearby cryo stations operational. The LOX hippos have been plumbed in a way to allow the flow to go to either the cryo stands or the flame trench area, with the latter being sub chilled. Shifting focus to the right, we can see that an additional LOX pump has been installed with space for one more to be installed in the future. Moving to the space between the booster cryo stand and the tank farm, we can see that new steel has appeared for what is speculated to be parts of the bucket of the trench for the ship firing stand. Thanks to Chrome Kiwi, here's a nice render of what the bucket might look like. Moving to the structural test portion of the site, we can see that the can crusher has been moved to the bottom of the site. Cryo lines to the can crusher have also been removed. Shifting down, we can see that the new foundations have been poured and dirt has been filled around the pad. Its purpose is still a complete mystery. Moving to the tent spotted last week, we can see a ring of stands has been installed within. It is not yet clear what has been constructed in here. Concrete work continues throughout the site with a notable new parking lot near the new white office and workshop building. Nearby, on Highway 4, at SpaceX's staging property, two new tanks have arrived. We will keep an eye on to see where these end up. Here's a labelled map of the site so we can catch up with the changes. Now that you're familiar with Sanchez, let's compare this photo from the flyover on February 8th, with the aerial shot captured in this week's flyover on the 18th. Close to Highway 4, we have the stand construction area where a new automated booster transport stand is practically complete, with just the alignment pins missing. Off to the right we see a steel plate. It's unclear what this could be for, with one guess being top of a tank, though they are usually constructed in situ. Another speculation from BJ and the show and tell crowd is a temporary weatherproof cover for the top of unstacked boosters. We can see more parts nearby, suggesting that there may be more than one. There is a pile of curved square steel next to it that seems to match the curve, so we will also have to keep an eye on these extra parts. Closer to it is the third ship engine installation stand that will be installed in Mega Bay 2, now unofficially called Ship Bay. The work platform for this stand has been moved out of the way nearby. If we look closely, we notice a new structure that is being assembled at the right side of the stand. We don't know what this is at the moment, but here is what Ryan Hansen speculated on the last Starbase weekly stream. Quote, Current speculation is it's a jig but unsure if it's a production jig for Star Factory or a testing jig for Massey's. I'm leaning towards the latter. Here's another render thanks to Chrome Kiwi, providing a little more detail. Looking at this ground photo, we can see that it is rather beefy and has a well-braced cylindrical part in the top section. Looking further to the right again, there is yet another mystery item under construction with 8 radial beams and huge pipe sections nearby that could be some kind of construction jig for rings. Though once again, this is only speculation. Tell us what you think about these new parts in the comments below. Moving up, we have the tower sections area where section 8 is quickly being constructed. To the right, new pillar stands are in place to start constructing section 9. This place will soon get very busy as four more segments have arrived at Port Brownsville. 
these new sections, 1, 2, 3 and 6, can be seen arriving in this footage from Jessica Kirschcam, edited by Nick Lovell. At the natural gas plant, the new diesel tanks are completely installed and ready to supply the generators in case the power from Brownsville has any outages. Rolling to the scrapyard, a new three ring section has been listed for scrapping. This is most likely one of the first sections built in the Star Factory and could have had a construction issue. This happens typically when a new manufacturing line is being tested. To the right, the new water tank continues to grow, with just three more sections to be finalised. Closer to the rocket garden, the crane that has been used for months has been disassembled. It could be moved to masses to help with large structure construction, or maybe it's leaving Starbase. We'll keep an eye out for it. Nothing else has changed here since the last flyover, although we see the booster puck shucker stand waiting for booster 13 to be ready for cryogenic proof testing. The concrete slab near the pump house has been poured and what looks like pedestals for the nearby cryo tank to be installed. Finally, if we look over at the parking lot near Highway 4, we can see the foundation work of the new multi-level parking structure has started, with this drilling rig breaking ground to make the all too familiar piles. A number of them can already be seen nearby. And that's it for Sanchez. Now entering the build site, where Star Factory expansion shows no signs of slowing. Let's take a look at Procky's map of the various bays and factories as we make our way around this site. Before we check out this week's progress, let's compare this photo from the flyover on February 8th with this photo taken 10 days later on February 18th. Beginning with this angled view of the bays, let's zoom into Mega Bay 2 where we find that the roof cladding has been mostly completed around the facade as well as around the elevator shafts. A small extension to Mega Bay 2 was built on the front right side of the building, in addition to the one at the back right we saw two weeks ago. Now looking into the bay, Ship 29 can be seen on the very edge atop its engine installation stand. The day before the flyover on the 17th, ground shots show that the yellow crane used to lift equipment in and out of Mega Bay 2 has been laid down. Switching to this angle, we can see the second ship engine installation stand receiving supports on the back side. Now moving on to Mega Bay 1, we see a four ring section of B-14's LOX tank staged outside the bay. After the door was fitted on Mega Bay 1 and the ring yard was removed and replaced with footings for Star Factory, these sections staged outside the bays are going to be the only sign of progress that we see on booster construction. Speaking of the door, additional horizontal beams are going on top of Mega Bay 1 to shorten the height of its entrance. This will serve as a cover for the door when it's fully rolled up. We can infer from the shortened height that no further extensions to the booster will be made in the foreseeable future, unless the hot staging ring is not installed in the Mega Bay. Boosters physically can't get any taller without bumping into this shorter entrance. Two days after our flyover on the 20th of February, Lab Padre's Rover 1 captured Booster 10 rolling back to Mega Bay 1, following a couple of wet dress rehearsal attempts that we'll touch on in the next section. This is likely just for final preparations before its launch on IFT3. Thanks to Vix for creating this time lapse. Next up is the High Bay, home to ships 30 on the inside and 31 closest to the exit. We'll start off this section of the Star Factory by checking out this beautiful sideways angle showing the build site in all its glory. Zooming in, an angled piece of concrete can be seen. If we look closer at this image, we notice there are massive bolts jutting out of the concrete slab which is surrounded by a pretty massive moat of rainwater from the storm which delayed our previous two flyover attempts. Due to the presence of footings right up to the slanted concrete slab, as well as its alignment with the part of the Star Factory facing Highway 4, we can guess that this will act as the exterior facade of the Star Factory and might perhaps feature a sign. Next up, we notice that two beams have been erected right up against the cladding of the already constructed segment of the Star Factory. Unlike the beams to the left, these are not connected directly to the roof beams. The reason could be because they were either not designed to bear the load of additional roof sections, or SpaceX may not want to interrupt production of taller nose cone sections by removing the cladding and thus exposing the factory to the elements. Moving up the Star Factory, regular watchers might know by now the yellow vapour barrier signals a concrete pour as Star Factory's expansion comes full circle to meet the original building. Also worth mentioning is this wall looking structure that was constructed for what we likely think is aesthetics for viewers looking from Highway 4. The last item we'll look at at the build site this week is the multi-storey office building, which is receiving the first of many foundations. The red water pumps and pipes stretching around the site gives us a clue about the outline of this future building. 
Behind the factory building, a concrete wall to shore up the edges of the site is being erected on substantial footings with large drainage type pipes staged nearby. A similar wall was constructed behind the Starlink building. Lastly, a quick look over towards the village shows some roadwork and continued residential construction. Let's see what's been happening at the launch site over the last week. As a quick refresher, here's a labelled map. Let's start with a picture from the last flyover on the 8th of February and compare it with the most recent flyover on the 18th. We'll mix things up this week and get started at the orbital tank farm. Up near the main entrance to the launch site, we see where the new concrete pad was poured next to the communications hut. The purpose of this pad remained a mystery at the time of the flyover. That wouldn't be the case for much longer, however. On the morning of February 19th, two vertical tanks were delivered to the launch site and mounted on top of the recently reinforced pad. The purpose of these tanks is not yet known, but the leading theory is LN2 storage for gaseous nitrogen to supply pressure to the hot dog tanks. A total of six vaporizers were also delivered with the tanks. Looking at the first three of the new hot dog tanks, with the work platforms installed, we see new plumbing has been installed from the tanks over to the pipe racks. These are the first connections to be made to the tanks, with many more to follow soon. At the tanker offload lot, it appears all of the pads needed to support the large pipe racks have now been poured, with the last two just behind the compressed gas trailers. Moving to the location of former GSE Tank 8, which was used for water storage, we see two narrow trenches have been dug into the concrete pad with plenty of rebar waiting in the centre. Remember the speculation mentioned weeks ago that vaporisers might occupy this location? These trenches could be the start of new forms to build pedestals that could support beams from mounting of the new vaporizers recently delivered. A concrete pump truck was spotted in this area on Tuesday, February 20th, so our next flyover should reveal new details. Over at the new concrete blast wall, work is underway to prepare a concrete apron on the front slope. This should help prevent erosion from undermining the base of the wall. Skipping the launch pad for now, we'll focus our attention on the new building by the Deluge Tank Farm. In this ground image, we can see the concrete roof has been poured and work to remove the supporting framework from underneath is now underway. Switching angles, we see most of the supports have been removed from the outer perimeter of the building. Moving back to the launch pad now, we see a fully stacked B10 and S28 on top of the launch mount for the first time. The lead up to the long awaited stack began back on February 8th, when B10 rolled to the launch site early in the day. The booster was hoisted onto the OLM during the overnight hours. On February 10th, before daylight, S28 made its way to the launch site too, with stacking being completed one day later on the 11th. This was short-lived however, as issues with what appeared to be the mating hardware between the two vehicles required a de-stack the next night. Crews spent the next 24 hours inspecting the aft skirt of the ship for apparent damage and performed necessary modifications to prepare for the next stack. Finally, on February 13th, S28 was stacked on top of B10 once more ahead of the impending test campaign. SpaceX confirmed the plans for the full stack later that day on X, stating, Starship team is preparing for a full launch rehearsal ahead of Flight 3. This laid to rest any speculation from fans in the days leading up to the campaign that we might only see minimal testing with the launch date still seemingly so far away still. What was to come, however, identified the importance of performing wet dress rehearsals ahead of launch day. The first attempt at the rehearsal would come on February 14th. With the village evacuated, the roadblock moved further back toward the build site, the tank farm came to life and began chilling down the prop lines leading to the OLM and ship QD arm. A small amount of locks was loaded into the ship before testing came to a halt. This would be the end of prop loading for the day. The first test of the steel flame deflector plate since IFT2 was later observed, along with several CO2 purges of the booster's engine bay. After some work was observed being performed on the ship QD arm on the 15th, another attempt at the rehearsal was made on February 16th. Testing got underway much sooner on this attempt, with more progress being made. Partial loading of the locks and methane tanks on both vehicles was observed prior to testing coming to a halt once again. Detanking would soon commence, along with multiple purges of the booster engine bay. The OLM work platform was moved back under B10 following the failed second attempt of the launch rehearsal, along with S28's transport stand as seen here during our flyover on Sunday the 18th. Over on the suborbital side, the LR11000 can be seen waiting next to Pad B, with the two-point lifting jig just behind it. Not long after this flyover, S28 would be de-stacked from B10. The ship was moved and lifted onto the test stand on the 19th, 
This marked the first time the new two-point lift system had been used on a ship at the launch site. It appeared SpaceX might skip additional engine testing following potential engine swaps prior to its move back to the launch site. But the possibility of additional testing is now back on the table. Get it? Back on the table? Also visible at the suborbital site at the time of our flyover, however, is B-10's transport stand and SPMTs. After the chopsticks were moved into position on the 19th, B-10 was removed from the OLM later that evening, after the intermittent road closure initially scheduled for the early morning hours of the 20th was revoked, due to the later than expected lift. Another was issued between the hours of 12 and 3pm Central Time. B-10 made its way back to the build site and into Megabay 1 during that time. We'll close out this video with some exciting news ahead of Flight 3. Trucks transporting the explosives and firing caps for the flight termination system were spotted arriving at the launch site on the morning of the 20th, with both materials being placed inside the storage bunker by the blast wall. Interestingly, in an unrelated Spaces event on X the evening of the 19th, Elon Musk answered a few impromptu questions about Starship, indicating the third flight could occur as soon as the second week of March. And that's it for episode 32 of Starbase Flyover Update. Thank you for choosing to fly with RGV Aerial Photography, and I hope you all enjoyed the flight. If you liked what you saw today, please subscribe for more episodes and content so you don't miss out on any of the new videos each week. I'm Jeff A, and I'll see you next week for another update on all things that are happening at Starbase Texas.